Hi y'all, in this video I'm going to talk a little bit about the Secret Service agent who wouldn't take a bullet for Trump. If you watched my last video, you know I talked about um, Acting Attorney General Yates and her unwillingness to uh, live up to her oath. So too is that true with the Secret Service agent, so too is it true with quite a lot of government officials. They raise their hand and they swear out their oath, but you know, they don't really mean it. This is actually a thing in England for um, Republicans, and that's little r Republicans as, as opposed to monarchists who uh, will cross their fingers and they take their oath to the Queen. And it, it reminds me on all these occasions of an anecdote from a book called A Diary from Dixie by uh, it's the diary of Mary uh, Boykin Chestnut, who was the wife of a Brigadier General and aide-de-camp to Jefferson Davis, De Jefferson Davis from the Confederate uh, States of America during the Civil War. And it was about Winfield Scott, General Winfield Scott, who was trying to find ways to get officers in, uh, the United States of America, not to resign their commissions, and it was by promising that they would not be sent to fight uh, against their own states. And there's a guy uh, who Mary Boykin just that knew, named Captain Ingram, who said that'll never do. Uh, if they take their government's pay, they must do its fighting. When uh, you, This was a time, for whatever their other moral failings, this was a time where they took honor very seriously. Honor uh, to your word, you take an oath, uh, it is a sake. It is on your sacred honor. You give up that oath by you know once your off term of office expires, or you die. You've really got to work at it. Duty and honor really meant something. These weren't the punchlines to jokes. These were matters over which people's lives and deaths would be arbitrated, uh, you know, with violence. They were so important. But this Secret Service agent apparently was was struggling with obeying the law, the Hatch Act in particular and living up to her duty. This woman I find exceedingly contemptible. She does not live up to the honor of the men who formed this country, uh, to be sure. Now, when I was uh, an up-and-coming troopie, we learned these things called the Pelian Principles, and, you know, fidelity to duty, and all these other things. And um, the Pelian Principles have always been important to me. They were started by a guy, well, under his tenure, a guy named Robert Peel so, uh, from um, England. And it's really the first kind of organized professional police force that you can really trace uh, our roots back to is a real attempt at having a full-time, professional, disciplined, you know, ethical, re ethically responsible police force rather than kind of the way it had always been done. And he came up with all that, well, he and people in his office, came up with a certain set of principles that uh, one should expect of um, servants in law enforcement. And one of them is to seek and preserve public favor, not by pandering to public opinion, but by constantly demonstrating absolutely impartial service to law in complete independence of policy and without regard to the justice or injustice of the substance of individual laws by ready, by ready offering of individual service and friendship to all members of the public without regard to their wealth or social standing, by ready exercise of courtesy and friendly good humor, and this part is important too, and by ready offering of individual sacrifice in protecting and preserving life. Now think about this this agent who's wondering whether or not she would actually take a bullet to, for, for Trump. On the one hand, she'd be failing in her duty to protect the, uh, the uh, president's life, with her own, to shield the president with her own body, but on the other hand, saying she's willing to give a murderer a free shot. Uh, a murder is going to happen. She could if she could do something to intervene to stop a murder from taking place, she would not actually stop that murderer from committing a murder. This woman is absolutely incompetent. Um, for her, apparently her oath to the Constitution, her oath to law enforcement, is really something that she'll follow if and when it's convenient. Now, I never struggled um, with enforcing laws. Uh, of any validly, infor uh, any validly enacted law I had no issue whatever in enforcing it. I might not have agreed with the law, and in fact, I often did not agree with the law, but the absolute impartiality in service, not only in actually just being impartial and doing the work, but also the appearance of impartiality, which means keeping your mouth shut. Take a, a look at Justice Ginsburg of late, in the, uh, before the election, the things she was saying about Donald Trump, and then she'd come out and apologize for it. I should be more circumspect. Yes, you should, and indeed, it's an ethical obligation of judges of the United States.
to refrain from bringing the judiciary into disrepute. It's something you voluntarily agree to do when you swear out that oath and accept that commission. You take your government's pay, you do your government's bidding according to law and according to your oath. And if and when there's ever a division between what the law requires you to do or what you think the law requires you to do and what your conscience will permit you to do, your option is to resign. Now, in cases of the draft, not really an option if you're enlisted out there in, the, in, in war because, you know, trying to resign in war is called desertion and you know, skulking can get you killed pretty quickly. So in those cases, uh, you know, do the best you can. <laughs> That's all I can say. I don't have any great advice for you. Just, you know, do the best you can to make a home. Uh, good luck. Glad I'm not you. But in any event, it's, it's not simply just being an impartial uh, doer of one's duty, but appearing to be impartial, which means refraining from engaging in political speech that could bring into disrepute a decision you may later have to make, which worked out well for me when I was up and coming, uh, when I went into law enforcement, because I wound up working cases uh, predominantly dealing with either someone who's dead or dying. Uh, it was a high um, risk incident, a high dollar amount for the government, or a public official of some type was involved in something, or an aid to a public official, and it could go public and, you know, they always want to have, oh, the only reason this guy's investigating this and making this recommendation is because of his political affiliation. From the time I joined the Army uh, all the way through the end of my government service, I did not register to vote. I never expressed a political opinion to anybody, uh, which was actually very easy because none of uh, my coworkers ever really expressed much of a uh, political opinion. We didn't talk about it. Uh, we did our duty. We were good friends, we were good comrades, I would say. We got along uh, reasonably well most of the time, most of us. Uh, very, very congenial, very competitive, which I, I like, you know, very manly, uh, but not, not political talk. Uh, that just did not happen, especially not at work. Um, that was a big no-no, but even like out for a beer, it, very rarely there'd be a passing comment about something particularly stupid that someone had done, uh, but it wasn't, uh, a, it wasn't a partisan kind of zinger. It was a, oh my God, he did that? What an idiot. I would have been caught doing that. That's all I'm saying. You know, it just ain't me. Anyway, so wait, if and when I ever got involved in something where, you know, inevitably my credibility or my impartiality would, would come into question in, in the media, they would have no way to go, well, let's see who he voted for. Because that never factored into the, de the decisions that I made about arrest, don't arrest, recommend prosecution, don't recommend prosecution. By the way, on the whole Hillary Clinton thing about, oh, law. Who do, who do the cops think they, who's the FBI think it is making uh, recommendations about prosecution? The FBI doesn't, doesn't make these decisions. Most of the prosecution decisions that happen in the United States are done right in the field by the investigator or the officer who is actually looking at things for the first time. But I think what the FBI should do is take uh, these Justice Department officials um, at their word that it's not proper for uh, the FBI director to have been really involved in it in that kind of way. And every case, every interview, every everything, where there is any hint possibly that a crime may have been committed, they should start calling prosecutors. One o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. I'm sorry, I don't want to make a decision on my own, boss. Uh, I need for you to weigh in on this. No, most of these things are weeded out right at the beginning from the judicious resource, the resourcefulness and the in intellect of the investigator who is out there, you know, taking the initial responder. Uh, most of the things just don't wind up with any charges being filed. Uh, it, it's just the nature of the beast. But if, if these prosecutors really mean it, then they should, they should really be complaining that every time an officer goes out to some, uh, some crime or report of a crime, that, that uh, the prosecutor is not getting a phone call from the officer to find out whether or not an arrest should be made, whether or not there's probable cause. No, you trust the officers to make decisions. And then if something blows up or something's being suppressed or something improper, then you get involved with it. But otherwise, it's completely proper uh, for law enforcement to be making recommendations to the prosecutors. Now, of course, it's the prosecutors, uh, once they're aware of something, it's their ultimate decision to, you know, whether or not to go forward, to bring it to a grand jury, or do an information, or whatever it happens to be in the state where they live, depending on the system. Um, that's, of course, true. But the, the front line on these decisions is made by police officers, day in and day out. Uh, you do to lack things all the time. Due to lack of investigative leads, this case is closed, and the office's file has been received for information with warrant its reopening. You know, you don't need to call a prosecutor and get permission for that kind of shit. Or if, if they're going to argue that you do, you should call them all hours of the night. Do, is there any corpus delecti here? I just can't figure it out. <laughs> you, you, don't, you really don't want the police doing that. <laughs> 
Shut up, prosecutors. Anyway, um, just uh, so at any at any rate, there were laws I disagreed with. Now, sometimes I would not enforce those laws, uh, not because I disagreed with the laws, just that they, it's there is a, an issue of discretion that officers have, and you don't want officers to to make an arrest or issue a citation at every conceivable opportunity, every time they think they have probable cause to effect an arrest or issue a summons. Uh, that's just asking cops to be complete assholes who you know, are uh, basically automatons. You hire people, you require them to be literate, you require them to have some brains, and to make decisions about, in this particular case, should this go forward or not. For example, I, didn't really, I, don't, I think most of the drug laws are fairly retarded uh, in all kinds of different ways. And I never effected an arrest for a person for simply possessing uh, drugs. In the same way that I never uh, issued a summons for people who didn't have a litter control device in their car. Uh, the, the test that I had was an objective standard. It wasn't, I don't like this law, I do like that law, I won't enforce, therefore I will enforce one and not the other. I had an objective uh, set of criteria. And if it was a low-level offense that did not pose, did not increase anyone's risk of being, in, uh, third party's risk of being injured, I let it go. Or, you know, a phone call to someone's parents if it's a kid who's underage and drunk or whatever it is. The fact that, a per, you know, some 14 or 15 year old's out drinking and gets in a car with some asshole who gets in a wreck doesn't mean the 14 or 15 year old kid was, a causal, was in the causal chain of that crash happening. And I gave them the same fair shot I gave everyone else. If it was something like that, that could just be handled with a good warning, you know, call someone's parents or just, you know, hey, knock that shit up, throw it away, whatever it is, uh, you, you want to do that. Professional policing, not asshole policing. Now, if it was something that in, that would uh, even fractionally increase the risk that someone else would be injured, or it was a higher level offense, then on those things, it's far less likely that I would just say, you know, don't do that. Give a warning. Give a. Uh, they call it a verbal warning, but I'd always get on the radio and clear it with the, with oral. You know, I'd be clear with an oral, because <laughs> you know I know people love to listen to the scanner. What, what the hell is he doing? I'm just doing some oral. Just doing. Doing my duty for king and country. Who? Cool. Anyway. Uh, so there was that. But there were other people I knew who they didn't really have an objective measure uh, when they would and when they wouldn't. Sometimes it would be, you know, based on the weather. And I'm not being facetious. I mean, quite literally. Uh, that if it was raining and they'd have to stand in the rain for longer, they were less likely to issue a citation uh, than they otherwise would be. And I'm like, no, no. To whatever extent you think that speeding or running red lights or whatever, what, to whatever extent that fractionally increases the risk of an accident in dry weather, it does it all the more in wet weather. So if you're going to do this based on the weather, you should do it in a logical way, which is to say that I'm going to be more lenient in the daytime when the roads are dry, not icy, you know, when the, <laughs> there's good traction and good sight lines and everything, good visibility, uh, less risk of a, of a collision there, so therefore I'm going to be more lenient than if you're <laughs> speeding in the dead of night, on ice, after it's been, you know, sleeting and raining. But no, uh, turns out that even though you want cops to be smart, not all of them work out to be that way. Some of them, well, they're smart on paper, I'll just put it that way. But yeah, so the more dangerous the activity was, the likelier they were to not uh, take enforcement action because they didn't want to get wet. <laughs> what are you going to do? Anyway, now on other things on, the du on, on duty, if you truly believe that um, a law or an order is unlawful, like it's clear to you that it's unlawful, you just disobey it. And then if it turns out you're wrong, you take the punishment. Uh, we have different types of immunity in the United States for government actors, qualified depending on, depending on where they are in the hierarchy, whether or not the prosecutor's judge is, regular civil servant, that kind of thing. Anyway, you have qualified uh, immunity and absolute immunity, and I'll talk about qualified immunity because it's the most relevant, it's the most common type. And it's in ambiguous cases. You know, the law has been passed. It's been signed into law. It seemed a little shady. Maybe it's legal. Maybe it isn't. I'm not entirely sure which it is. What should be the penalty for a person who guesses wrong in something where there's not any clear resolution of the legal matter? Well, some people think that the cops should just be personally liable. And the, the judgment is, no, they shouldn't be. If it's a legit legal question where there's ambiguity, you give the officers the benefit of doubt. They're trying to do the good. Th they're trying to do the right thing. They're making good faith e efforts to apply the law impartially, and they got it wrong. It's unfortunate for the citizen. There are other remedies available. Uh, we're not going to take the uh, the officer, the government officials, home for guessing wrong on an unclear legal question. Whereas on a clear legal question, where it's clearly unlawful and you do it anyway, you take your house, take your car, your pension, whatever, 
take the maximum amount from you that we can get because it was clearly unlawful. It was your affirmative obligation not to do it. You chose to do something anyway that violated substantial rights of citizens of these United States. You are liable. And of course, if it's lawful, then uh, you know, reciprocal logic there, you, you just follow it. If you take your government's pay, you must follow its lawful dictates. But no, the Secret Service agent uh, apparently is struggling to obey the Hatch Act, which uh, is, it, it is an attempt by the United States government to have a system which actually incorporates, uh, I don't know whether they did this intentionally, but it, whether by happenstance or by design, it nevertheless incorporates parts of the Pelian principles, what you want from a professional police force and other parts of the government the uh, absolute impartiality in the doing of their duty. You want to try to achieve that to the extent possible. Uh, judges have to be not only impartial, but they have to uh, avoid the appearance of any impropriety, which is a much harder standard. Not only are you required to abstain from doing certain things that are illegal, you're also required to abstain from anything that could give a reasonable inference to all these other things. Uh, of you know, ill repute, which is more difficult. Who you hang out with, what you say in your off time, you know, think about, I'm a little R Republican, which is to say not a monarchist, but Republican form of government. I'm not a capital R Republican, United States Republican. Uh, but I do admire the, uh, the royal family of, of the United Kingdom. Think about the Queen's position and how there's never been a violation, a variation from her, her duty. This isn't imposed by law, it's just convention, that she's apolitical. I'm sure that a person in her position you know, a queen who has sovereign power, and even though there are conventions that restrain how she uses it, the, the law is that she can do, uh, you know, many many things uh, that she wouldn't, in fact, actually do that she's legally permitted to do. And you see your government doing something, you think, my God, that is just terribly wrong. But the convention is that I don't get involved in politics. I stay out of it, and I keep my trap shut. The Queen of England has never violated that, such as I know. Justice Ginsburg, apparently less committed to her oath, less committed to her duty than the Queen of England. Uh, I really do admire the British royal family because of their, uh, their allegiance to their duty. If you think about uh, when the, prince, uh, the Queen was shot at, it was, it was blanks, but she didn't know it at the time. All she did was just, you know, calm her horse down while the guy's shooting. Hey, look, we're not, I'm not running. I'm not going to run away from that. You look at the, the attempted assassination of Prince Charles. The gunman comes running up and Prince Charles just <laughs> does his cups. Oh dear, he's got a gun. Well, I'm going to die in style. I'm not running. The Princess uh, Royale, um, I think it was Princess Royale, when someone tried to abduct her, the guy shoots her guard, puts a gun up to her, you know, in the back of the car, and says, come with me. And she looked at him, and she said, not bloody likely. <laughs> Just kill me right here. I admire that. Allegiance to duty. They realize that they, realize that, uh, they have a, um, an office that they occupy, which is greater than themselves, and they have a, a devotion to that, you know, it's their duty. And it simply will not do to have the head of state or, you know, the next one of the next heads of state or someone in the line of succession to be the head of state to be a, a bloody coward. So, oh my God, an assassin's coming. I'm going to run away and scream or I'm just going to go along with him. No, I'm, you might kill me, but I'm not cooperating. <laughs> I like that, that fighting spirit. I really do. Uh, I like that allegiance to duty. Um, for public officials. So, one of the problems is that if a person serves in certain position, and they don't take their oaths very seriously, uh, even if they do, I suppose this could still happen, they start to identify with the office that they hold. Like, they start, they stop being able to distinguish between me and my office, or this office that exists, which I, exer the powers of which I exercise. Uh, Keeping this, this line, this division, made things very easy for me. It's not, it doesn't matter what I personally think. It's also why I didn't take it personally in law enforcement when someone would, like, square off with me and, you know, try to beat me up, uh, take a shot at me when the guy pulled a knife on me. I never took it personally. It doesn't like they're like, oh, my God, you know, that's Joe Smith. I hate that, I hate that bastard. Let's go get him. No, I just happen to be the guy doing the job, you know, exercising the duties of my office, the powers of my office, consistent with the laws uh, that I swore to uphold. And it just happens to be the case that I ran across this guy. He's not angry with me. He just doesn't want to cooperate with the office I occupy. It, that's where the anger is. It makes it very easy. No PTSD about it. There's no stress after the, the event has settled down because, 
you know, it's they're not coming. It's not like they're going to my house after me personally for something that I just got bored and, and decided to go do. No, they're pissed off at the office and the laws, and I just have to be the agent executing it. And you know, it, it's it's uh, I get it. I don't hate them. Anyway, <laughs> doesn't mean I won't shoot them. I'm just saying I don't hate them. <laughs> I'm not a hater, but I am a shooter. I'm a shooter. I'm. I mean, really, I'm a shooter. Anyway, uh, I guess I'll leave it there with that innuendo, that double entendre. Have a great day.